Well, we've been going through the book of Ezekiel as a church, and Craig's going to be preaching to us from Ezekiel 12, verses 17 to 28 this morning. So if you wanted to reach in the Pew Bibles in front of you or look up at the DP behind me, that's Ezekiel 12, verses 17 through 28. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, eat your bread with trembling and drink your water with anxious shaking. Then say to the people of the land, This is what the Lord God says about the residents of Jerusalem in the land of Israel. They will eat their bread with anxiety and drink their water in dread, for their land will be stripped of everything in it because of the violence of all who live there. The inhabited cities will be destroyed and the land will become dreadful. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Again, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, What is this proverb you people have about the land of Israel, which goes, the days keep passing by and every vision fails. Therefore say to them, this is what the Lord God says. I will put a stop to this proverb and they will not use it again in Israel. But say to them, the days have arrived as well as the fulfillment of every vision. For there will no longer be any false vision or flattering divination within the house of Israel. But I, the Lord, will speak whatever message I will speak, and it will be done. I will no longer be delayed. For in your days, rebellious house, I will speak a message and bring it to pass. This is the declaration of the Lord God. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, notice that the house of Israel is saying, the vision that he sees concerns many years from now. He prophesied about distant times. Therefore say to them, This is what the Lord says. None of my words will be delayed any longer. The message I speak will be fulfilled. This is the declaration of the Lord God. Well, why don't we pray and then we'll look at a a very interesting passage. Father, thank you. I thank you for our uh, human fathers, but even more we thank you that you are our heavenly father, one who never fails us, a perfect father. I thank you for those who serve the church in so many ways. This morning, I thank you for our deacons who serve us so well, so faithfully behind the scenes. And Lord, as we look at your word, help us to understand the truths therein, how they point us to Christ and his gospel and the hope we have. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, Jeremiah Johnson was a self-proclaimed prophet. He grew to fame in the early days of the presidential election when Donald Trump was just a candidate, not looking like he was going to succeed, and he came out with a prophecy and said, God has shown me this man will be president. He used that prophecy to gain some serious donations and support. Hundreds and thousands of people began to follow him and support him. Fast forward four years, Trump's running for re-election. He's falling behind Biden in the polls and the supporters were worried, but many were comforted because Mr. Johnson came out and said, I have had another prophetic dream. And he described this dream where Donald Trump was running the Boston Marathon, but he was falling behind. And two frail older women emerged from the crowd, helped him across the finish line. And he declared, this is a message from God that Trump will certainly win second term as president. Guess what? He didn't. So what does a prophet do when they make a very bold declaration about something that does not come to pass? Well, here's what that one did. He said, I'm closing Jeremiah Johnson Ministries. But he added, fortunately for all my followers... I'm still a prophet and I'm starting a new ministry called the Alta Global. And you can follow me and more importantly, you can support me there. I find this stuff beyond tragic. It is dangerous. Our world is filled with self-proclaimed prophets. The New York Times did an article not long ago on the rise of prophecy. Christians are losing trust in institutional Christianity. And this article said they no longer want to hear from the church. They don't want to hear from pastors. They want to hear directly from God, so they're turning to prophets. Problem is, these new age prophets 
are nothing like Old Testament or even New Testament prophets. They get a lot wrong. They can't call fire down from heaven. They can't publicly raise the dead. And when they do speak, it's usually in generalities. I prophecy that the voice referendum will fail and the war in Ukraine will not be over by the end of the year. Well, so what? That happens? Does that prove they're a prophet? Far from it. Honestly, I think this lot of fake healing, fake prophesying shams should be shamed in a repentance for claiming the kind of nonsense they put out is prophecy from God. So why are these look nothing like the prophets of the Bible lot not universally written off as frauds? Well, unfortunately, today there is this idea that new covenant prophecy is different to what we read in the Bible. It's fallible. It can be the prophet's own thoughts. Instead of labelling these men and women as false prophets, today we hear it, they get it wrong, and we applaud and say, that was a really good effort. Have another shot. Now, I doubt with that rubbish in 1 Corinthians 12, you can read those sermons. But what does that have to do with the book of Ezekiel? Actually, a great deal, because if you think this stuff is new, read Ezekiel. Read the Old Testament. It is nothing new. Here's Ezekiel, a reluctant but true prophet sent out there into a sea of false prophets. They all have this message. You're not that bad, people, and Jerusalem's not going to fall. Ezekiel's the thorn in the side. He's the voice saying, <coughs> actually, God has a different message. You're depraved, and the Holy God's coming after you, and Jerusalem's absolutely going to fall. How does God deal with this? Well, this is our passage. So a reminder that the whole book of Ezekiel basically has this message. We deserve judgment. We are given hope. The outline's pretty simple. There's the call of Ezekiel. And then two big sections. 4 to 33, it's all about judgment. And 34 to 38, it's all about salvation. But as I told you, the key, the change comes in verse 34, where you get the section on the true shepherd and the new covenant. But basically, the book's divided into two, and we're still in this first section on judgment. And today we begin the section in verses 12 to 24, where Yahweh's temple is destroyed. Now, it's not just the temple that's destroyed. To destroy that means to destroy the city, to remove the people. God is withdrawing as being their God. But here's how this whole section fleshes out. What we're going to find in here is that this section is filled with some very specific prophecies. We're going to have events, we're going to have dates, we're going to have details. And the point is that when all of these come to pass exactly as God said, then they will know that Ezekiel is a true prophet. Now, this whole section, 13 chapters, it's designed as one unit. We know that because it starts and it ends with God saying, Ezekiel, I'm going to make you a sign to the house of Israel. And the sign is that what I tell you will come to pass. For example, in chapter 24, 1 and 2, Ezekiel is told, Ezekiel, write down today's date. Hold it up, show it to him and say, over in Judah, the siege began on this date. And when word finally does come back that the siege began, they say, well, <clears throat> what date did it start? It's that date. Now, you might say fulfilled prophecy is pretty useless. Better to work a miracle to get their attention. I mean, Ezekiel said Jerusalem will fall. They ignored him and Jerusalem fell. What's the whole point of that? Merely so Ezekiel can say... <coughs> I told you so. No, it's a lot more than that. You see, the point in the book of Ezekiel is that Ezekiel said a lot more than Jerusalem will fall. He has a much more important lesson. Starting at chapter 34 and on, he says, look, maybe you ignored me about Jerusalem, 
But there's something else I want to tell you that is far more important. This has to do with your eternal salvation. God is coming against the entire world in judgment and wrath. There is one way of escape, and whatever you do, believe me on that. So here's the whole point of this section, what we'll look at this week and next week. You can trust a true prophet's words concerning both judgment and salvation. You can trust a true prophet's words concerning both judgment and salvation. See, here's the idea. There's all these false prophets, we'll see, and they're saying, peace, peace, Jerusalem will not fall. Leaders of the nation are saying, ah, we believe these false prophets, Jerusalem will not fall, and all the people are going, great, we believe this, Jerusalem will not fall, yay. And then there is this voice going, um, dissenting voice, God wants me to say, Jerusalem's going to fall. Then Jerusalem falls. And chapter 33 ends with a really significant statement. Yet when all this comes true, and notice this, and it definitely will, I'm telling you, it definitely will, then they will know that a prophet's been among them. That is a crucial verse. All the stuff he says, very detailed, is going to come to pass exactly, then they'll know I'm a prophet. Why is this important? Because straight after this, he's going to start talking about salvation. New shepherd, new covenant, new people, new land, new temple. This is the really crucial stuff. If you believe he's a prophet, you'll believe him when he speaks to this. Now, 12 to 24 is all one section. I toyed with the idea of trying to fit it all in a one sermon and the guys were like, please don't, don't do it. 13 chapters and some of these are really long. So I relented, I listened and here's what we're going to do today. We're going to look at the opening and closing part of this section. The sections where God addresses Ezekiel and says, I'm making you a sign to the house of Israel. What is that sign? That I'm giving you prophecies that will come to pass. So have a look with me at Ezekiel beginning at chapter 12. I wanted you to see this first section, 12.1 to 14.23, fleshes out like this. Basically, it's talking about what is the sign of a true prophet with this interruption about, yeah, how do you know a false prophet? So we begin chapter 12, 1 to 20, with the sign of a true prophet. What is it? Well, basically, what they prophesy comes to pass. What they prophesy comes to pass. Honestly, brothers and sisters, I want to tell you this. If you read your Bible, it is not that hard to work out what a true prophet is. If someone says, I'm a prophet, the Bible gives a number of tests. First, do their words match up with revealed scripture? If someone today says, I'm a prophet, and one of their revelations is that Jesus is not God, you put a big cross through them. Does their life match up with godly characteristics? Someone says, I'm a prophet, but they're clearly in it for the money and the girls. Put a big cross through it. Are they willing to speak hard truths about the holiness of God and the state of our heart and our land? They will not tell you you're depraved and without hope and cannot save yourself. Put a cross through them. When there were prophets, some were given miracles so that the people would know, yes, this one speaks for God. But the main sign in Scripture is fulfilled prophecy. God reveals what will happen, not just some generalities, not a few specifics, the stuff that you can only know if God revealed it. And then if their words kind of pass, no misses, not like, yeah, I got over 50% on that. No, everything. Then you know this one's a true prophet. So in verses 1 to 20, Ezekiel becomes a sign. And we're going to see he makes a very specific prophecy. And it comes to pass exactly. So what happens here? He's told, this is what I want you to do. During the day, you make this knapsack that's an exile one. The stuff you would take if you were going into exile. You put a bit of food and personal items and clothes... It's exactly the stuff that they would have known because every single one of them would have packed this kind of knapsack to make the journey from Jerusalem to Babylon. 
Then at night he is to go out and he is to dig through the wall. Now, we don't dig through the walls of our houses much, but they were mud brick houses and you could dig through them. Now, it's possible that he's digging from the outside in. So he's gone out and he's digging back into his house to symbolise the attacking armies breaking into Jerusalem. More likely, those houses had an outer wall and he's digging through those to symbolise the desperate people in Jerusalem trying to get out. But the really significant part is he's to cover his face with some kind of hood that blinds him. And then he's to put it all together. He's to go out there at night, he's to find his bag, he's blinded, he's to find this hole, crawl through it, and blind it, head off in exile. Now, the Jews watching this probably understood some bits. They're like, I um, kind of get the exile knapsack and kind of get the digging through the wall. No idea what the crazy guy's doing with the blind hood thing. So Ezekiel says, glad you asked, let me tell you. Verse 10, he says, This pronouncement concerns the prince in Jerusalem and the whole house of Israel living there. The prince is how he refers to Zedekiah. Now, if you're a little rusty on your kings of Judah, let me give you the crash course on the last five kings of Judah. Basically, Mataniah was the third and youngest son of Josiah. Nebuchadnezzar wanted someone incompetent on the throne as king, so he went in, put Mataniah on the throne, and so that he would know and everybody would know, this is my boy, you belong to me. He renamed him and called him Zedekiah. Zedekiah is pretty useless. Um, two brothers and a nephew were chosen to be king before him, his last man standing. Ezekiel never, ever thinks of this guy as the true king. He views him as a weak puppet, because he was. He blames his poor leadership, his breaking of the covenant with Babylon for bringing destruction on the nation, because it did. Ezekiel, through in this book, cannot uh, bring himself to call him king. The best he can do is to refer to him as the prince. And he says, I'm going to give you a very specific prophecy about the prince. The prince is going to try and escape. The prince and the citizens who survived the sword are going to go into exile. The prince is going to have his face covered. He will not see the land. The prince will go into captivity in Babylon, but he won't see the city and he'll die there in captivity. And the prince's army will be scattered to the winds. Read 2 Kings 25. This prophecy came to pass exactly. Nebuchadnezzar lays siege to Jerusalem. Many are dying from famine. Finally, the Babylonian army breaks in and the people are trying to get out and escape, including the brave king Zedekiah. But he is cornered, he's caught, his army flees from him. So Nebuchadnezzar does this. He lines him up and all his sons. He kills his sons. And then he says, so the last thing you ever see is me killing your sons. He plucks out his eyes. He blinds him, he chains him, and he carts him off to Babylon. He never sees the city, and he dies there. Then, in 17 and 20, we get the end of this prophecy. The people of Jerusalem are going to go through this anxiety, the siege, stripped of everything. The city is destroyed. But here's the point. These exiles that are receiving this prophecy, they're going to live to see everything Ezekiel said come true exactly. Everything he said about how the city will fall, the devastation, the siege, how people will be killed, it's all going to come to pass. And they are actually going to live to see Zedekiah blinded, chained, alone, marched in shame into Babylon. You imagine watching that and they're going, oh my, that stuff Ze uh, Ezekiel said can it pass exactly? Maybe Ezekiel is a true prophet. Well, now we move to false prophets. What's the sign of a false prophet? Well, basically what they prophesy does not come to pass. Ah, look, they get a few things right, everyone does. But the other thing is they pander to men. They say, hey, we know what you want to hear, let's tickle a few ears. Look at it, verses 21 and 22. Again, the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, what is this proverb you people have 
about the land of Israel, which goes, the days keep passing by and every vision fails. See, the people of Israel were saying, you know all those prophets who spoke of the destruction of Jerusalem? Their prophecies never came to pass. The prophets keep going, doom, doom. Destruction, destruction. Blah, blah. Doesn't happen. We're saying, sure, you know, some people have been carted off. Sure, there's some dangerous armies out there. We're still in the land. The temple is ours. We've heard this vision for years. We don't believe it anymore. Ezekiel, you're just one of these people saying, doom, doom, and it does not come to pass. We think the other guys, the prophets saying, peace, peace, are right. Well, God says, will you tell them this? Look at verses 23 to 25. I'll put a stop to this proverb, and they will not use it again in Israel, but say to them, the days have arrived, as well as the fulfilment of every vision, there will no longer be any false vision or flattering divination within the house of Israel. I'll speak a message and bring it to pass. This is the declaration of the Lord God. They're going to say, my word's going to fail. When they say, peace, peace, it's going to die on their lips. Judgment will arrive while they are saying, peace in our time. They said, the day is not coming, the day is here. Verse 27 and 28. Son of man, notice that the house of Israel is saying, the vision that he sees concerns many years from now. He prophesies about distant times. Therefore say to them, this is what the Lord God says, none of my words will be delayed any longer. The message I speak will be fulfilled. This is the declaration of the Lord God. Some were saying, look, even if we give you that judgment is going to come, looks doesn't look like it to us in our generation. It's way down the track. The grandkids can deal with it. The leaders and the false prophets are saying, you guys, it's okay. Build your houses, get on with life, ignore guys like Ezekiel. And God says, no more delay, today's the day. Look, I hope you realise this kind of thing happens today. If you go out and you share the gospel, one of the common things people are going to say is, really? Judgment? You Christians have been saying, the end is nigh for 2,000 years. That's scare tactics for the feeble-minded. Even if you were right, look, the world looks pretty good right now. We got AI, medicine, we got the rest. Uh, If it does happen, it's way down the track. I'll be dead, I don't care. Talk to the hand. The Bible says, look... The reason is that God has given a time for repentance. But that time is not forever. There will come a day where God says, time's up and judgment will fall. And even if it's not in our lifetime, believe me, when you die, you will care whether you listened or not. But the point here is that some prophets who were false and leaders were saying, ignore Ezekiel, Ignore the doomsayers. God's not going to act. He's all threat, no action. And God says, well, their action is here. And those who said peace, peace will be shown for what they are, false prophets. Look at Ezekiel 13, 1 to 7. The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel who are prophesying. Say to those who prophesy out of their own imagination, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord God says. Woe to the foolish prophets who follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. Your prophets, Israel, are like jackals among ruins. You did not go up to the gaps or restore the wall around the house of Israel so that it might stand in battle on the day of the Lord. They saw false visions and their divinations were a lie. They claimed this is the Lord's declaration when the Lord did not send them. Yet they wait for the fulfillment of their message. Didn't you see a false vision and speak a lying divination when you proclaimed? This is the Lord's declaration, even though I had not spoken. These men are saying, I'm a prophet. This is a declaration of the Lord. And what they were saying is, judgment's not coming. Peace, peace. So they're like jackals howling in ruins. The city's being ruined and they're just howling peace, peace. They're like those who the foundations are crumbling and instead of repairing them, they get out a bit of whitewash and put it on and say, nothing to see here, looks good. They're not encouraging the people to restore the wall and fill the gaps by repenting and putting away idols. 
They removed faith in the true prophets and they left Israel vulnerable. They said, this is the Lord's declaration and people believed it. Deuteronomy 18, 20 to 22 says, if a prophet dares speak in the God's name, and it does not come to pass. You name them false prophet and you kill them. You cleanse that defilement from the land. Prophecy is how God communicates truth. So to say, I got a message from God when you don't, it is so serious that under the old covenant, you have to be killed to be silenced. In verses 8 and 9, God says, I'm going to remove their influence. They're not going to have a voice in the land when the people return from exile. They're going to die in the judgment. Verse 10 to 16, they're saying peace when there is no peace. These false prophets are just papering over the cracks with whitewash. They're saying God's loving. He won't judge you. You're not that bad. The Lord says, I'm going to pull their whitewash wall down. I'll tear the city down around their ears and the false prophets are going to die in there as they are saying, peace, peace. Wow. Verses 7 and 19, he turns his wrath upon women who falsely prophesy. But these ones are doing something a bit different. They're making a bit of money by selling their magic bands and magic veils, probably with the promise, these will protect you from the wrath to come. You know, wear one of these and you'll be fine. <coughs> Ezekiel says... That's pagan hogwash. Verse 22. All it does is stop men and women from repenting because they're trusting this will save them rather than turning to me. God says, I'm going to rescue my people and silence the false prophets. Brothers and sisters, this stuff is not new. It happened in the days of Ezekiel, happened in the days of the apostles, it happens today. People do not want to hear the truth. They want to believe that they're pretty good. They're in the top 50% and God will never touch that. And the fact that God's grace has been delayed makes them think it won't come. And when there are people saying, I speak for God, I am a prophet, I am a teacher, trust me, they want to believe it, so they do. They want to trust in these charlatans. Some of them want to it's trust in their baubles. You can go out and you can buy a bit of John the Baptist bone. You can buy a splinter of the cross. For a fair price, you can get a tear of the Virgin Mary and it will save you from judgment. If you don't want to wait for judgment and you want a bit of healing now, guess what? You can get a handkerchief prayed over by the prophet Benny himself at a fair price and it'll cure you. And you trust these trinkets rather than God. I'm telling you. These things don't cure you, they do not save you, and they can stop you from real repentance and dealing with hard issues. These claims are whitewash. Judgment's coming, you need to know it's coming, and the only way to escape. Today we've got false prophets. More common are false teachers who are tickling your ears and saying things like, you're okay, you do not need to repent. It's not salvation by faith alone. Now, I don't care how persuasive they are. They're not teaching what the Bible teaches. You name them from what they are and move on. Well, now our passage gets back to the main point, the sign of a true prophet. Again, what is it? Basically, what they prophesy comes to pass. Why do men and women reject the true word of God? Because we prefer to listen to tales woven, woven by false prophets. Tales that say God is love, that he wants you to enjoy this life, that you have time to repent, that if you're reasonably good, you'll be saved. A true prophet speaks truths that are unpopular, but they are God's truths. So here in chapter 14, the elders of Israel come to Ezekiel. Now, if you read the whole chapter, it seems the context is this. They have been told a lie, they wanted to believe that lie, and they're coming to Ezekiel and saying, how come you're not saying the same as everyone else? The other prophet said, yeah, there are some bad people in Jerusalem, 
But you've got to concede there's also some good ones, some righteous ones. And surely the God of Abraham, the God we all know and all love, will never destroy, destroy the righteous with the unrighteous. Your message that he's wiping the whole city out, it is harsh, it is unloving, and frankly, we don't think it's biblical. How about Ezekiel, you know, we reassure the people by you singing from the song, same song sheet as everyone else. Well, God has a message for them. The problem is you want to believe the lie, so you believed the lie. Verse 3. Son of man, these men have set up idols in their hearts and have put up sinful stumbling blocks in front of themselves. Should I actually let them inquire of me? I think if you could see the hearts of these men, they'd be stunned by this. In their minds, they're not like the elders in Jerusalem who actually carved out idols and put them up in the temple. But Ezekiel is told, no, these guys have idols just the same. They're idols in their heart. We do not know with certainty what these idols were. Likely they're being seduced by the gods of Babylon, the wealth of Babylon, the security of Babylon. You know, later, when they're allowed to go back, a lot of them go, we'd rather stay in Babylon. But it also seems one idol was, we're good people. And God's not going to judge good people like us. He's too merciful. And God says, you're listening to the idols of your heart. You are listening to false prophets and false teachers who are telling you what you want to believe. You believe that, you'll be judged. Verse 6, if you really want to hear what I have to say, you turn from your idols, you repent, you deal with them. People want to believe what they want to believe. They want to believe that God's some benevolent grandfather in the sky who overlooks all sin, so they believe it. They'll tell you it. I will not worship that kind of God. This is the kind of God I want to worship. That lie leads you to death. And he says, if you trust the lie, verses 7 and 8, the only answer you're going to get is judgment, you'll be cut off from your people, you'll die eternally. These elders came to Ezekiel with an argument they think is biblical. God will not wipe out the unrighteous along with the righteous. Now, they shouldn't know the answer if they only bothered to read their Bible. This comes up a number of times. The most famous one is in Genesis 18. God says to Abraham, I'm wiping out Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham says, really? Verse 23, will you wipe away the righteous with the wicked? And then he gives his thoughts further. God, you could not possibly do such a thing. To kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike, you could not possibly do that. Won't the judge of the whole earth do what is just? Well, that bit he got right. Abraham thinks right is to spare the relatively righteous with those around them. God says, okay, for argument's sake, what if there's 50 righteous? I'll spare the city. And Abraham's thinking, oh, 50... How about, how about 45? Let's bargain, God. Go, all right. Okay, 30. All right. 20. Okay, 10. Deal. Abraham's convinced there's got to be at least 10 righteous people in a city as big as Sodom and Gomorrah. Guess what? There weren't. There's Lot. Now, putting Lot as righteous together, maybe that doesn't go well with you, but at least in the Bible it does. 2 Peter 2.7 says that. He wasn't particularly godly, but he did believe God. Faith afforded him that righteousness. So by grace, God spared him and his daughters from that city, but not the city. The city's wiped off the face of the earth. Sodom's gone. The presence of Lot could not save it. Well, then we come to verse 9. But if the prophet is deceived and speaks a message, it was I, the Lord, who deceived that prophet. There have always been false prophets. Who know they're false prophets? There are people today telling you that they are prophets. They know they are not. They just know there's a lot of gullible people out there that are easily fleeced. And by claiming that, that is a good way to get money, sex and power. But far more dangerous are the ones who are false prophets who think they are genuine prophets. And here we see God deceives them. What does that mean? Scripture teaches several things about this. Ultimately, God is sovereign over everything, including prophecy. He can even use 
these false prophesy, uh, prophecies to work his ends. But the picture in Scripture is not this. It's not that there are these people that just love truth and trying to be holy, and God goes, nah, I'm going to deceive you. That, that's not the way it is. All throughout, these ones are those who do not believe the truth. They hate the truth. And they want to believe a lie, and eventually God says, fine, believe the lie. Let me give you some examples. 2 Thessalonians 2, 10 to 12. They perish because they did not accept the love of the truth and so be saved. They didn't accept the truth. For this reason, God sends them a strong delusion so that they will believe the lie, so that all will be condemned. Those who did not believe the truth but delighted in unrighteousness. They delight in unrighteousness. They don't want to believe the truth, so God lets them believe the lie. 1 Kings 22. This is a classic one. If you read that chapter, here's what's going on. The king of Judah, Jehoshaphat, goes up and meets with the king of Israel, and they go, we should join forces and go against Aram. But they go, oh, you know, we kind of at least got to see if it's God's will, don't we? So they gather these 400 so-called prophets and go, should we go up? And all of them say, march up, march up, the Lord will hand it over. But then Jehoshaphat says, hang on, haven't you got a real prophet up here? Um, what's his name? Micaiah. Micaiah, I didn't see him out there. And the king of Israel says, yeah, he, he never gives me the prophecy I want to hear, so I didn't invite him. And they're like, mm, let's call him. So he comes in, so there's Micaiah, then there's the 400. And one of the false prophets, Zedekiah, puts on this show. He gets these iron horns he's made, and he waves them all around and says, God says, go up and you will gore the Arameans. And the rest of the 400 are going, yeah, gore, gore. God will hand them over to you. And then verse 13, the messenger went to call Micaiah and instructed him, look, the words of the prophets are unanimously favourable for the king, so let your words be like theirs and speak favourably. Get with the program. Don't say something different. You know, we all got to speak the same here. They don't want the truth. They just want to believe the lie. So Micaiah gets to the program, sure, sure, whatever. And he goes, yes, march up and succeed, and the Lord will hand it over. It's obviously pretty vague and pretty ironic, and the king says, all right, doesn't sound like the truth. Why don't you speak the truth? He says, okay, you want the truth? You go up and the shepherd's going to die, so you, king, you're going to die. Ooh. And then he adds, and the reason these guys are all saying the same is God sent a deceiving spirit into their mouths. Ooh. Zedekiah doesn't like that, and he goes up and whacks him. And the king says, now you take him and you lock him up. I'll deal with him when I get back. And Micaiah says, well, here's the thing about that. If you do actually come back, then I'm a false prophet, so I should die. The king goes, all right, well, I will disguise myself, and I'm going to hang back in the battle. But it didn't matter. A carelessly shot arrow killed him. So here's the idea. There are men and women who want to believe that they are prophets, but they don't want to believe the truth. They really want to believe the lie, and eventually God allows them to believe it. And they speak it. And then there are other men and women who don't want to hear the truth, and they want to believe the lie, and they hear these prophets speak, and they go, that is truth. And God says, you both defile the land, you'll both be cut off, you're both going to die. In Jerusalem... The ones saying peace, peace, and the ones believing peace, peace, you're all going to die. Great. And then in verses 12 to 23, God reveals a truth. He speaks of Noah, Daniel, and Job. These are men of renowned faith. By faith, they were considered righteous. Well, if they were in Jerusalem, surely Jerusalem would be saved. God says, no, he might spare them by his mercy, like he spared Lot, but not the city. The city would still fall. See, even men like that can't save the city. And by the way, when you read this, there are no Noah's, Daniel's and Job's there in Jerusalem. So the whole idea of the false prophets is, look, there's some relatively righteous people in there. You know, they're, they're better than others. God's not going to come in judgment and wipe them out too. Here's the point. 
Jerusalem and Babylon are flooded with these ear-tickling prophets. They're all saying the same thing. The leaders are saying the same thing. The people are getting on board. There are a couple of thorns in the flesh. There's an Ezekiel, there's a Jeremiah saying, <clears throat> dissenting voice. You broke the covenant. You are sinners. Jerusalem will fall. They're unpopular. They're shunned. They are encouraged to be quiet or to get with the program. And God says, no, nah, you've got to keep saying it. Why? Because when it comes to pass, they'll know a true prophet was among them. Now, skip to chapter 24. Here we also deal with unerring fulfilling of the plan of God. It's the other bookend of this section. Once again, God says, I'm going to make you a sign. It starts off and he says, write down today's date. It is going to prove to be the day the siege began in Jerusalem. Now, bit technical but the dating method here is a bit different to the rest of the book elsewhere he uses the dating system of the exiles here he uses the dating system in Jerusalem because this is happening in Jerusalem but when the date come when when word finally comes and the date is revealed this is the day the siege began and then he goes and say when it began remember you guys said Jerusalem's a pot that will protect and preserve well, I'm going to turn it into a pot, but a different kind. It's going to boil them, cook them, and destroy them. You read this, and Jerusalem is pictured as the city filled with corruption. And God says, the fire of my wrath is going to burn off the impurity within. Then in verses 15 and 24, he says, you're going to be a sign. Here's the sign. Your wife's going to die, and you won't mourn. Wow. Wow. She is described as the delight of his eyes. She's precious to him. He obviously loves her. And God says, when I take it, you can't mourn. You can't weep. You just get on with your life and you dress normally and you go on with life. How hard would that be? Your wife dies. You're choking back tears. You're not to break down. You're not to do anything. You just act normal. And at worst, God says, and I'm doing it as a sign. Everything inside you would probably be saying, can I resign as a prophet? Leave, leave my wife alone. This is really unjust. You know, I'm doing all this lying on the side, knapsack stuff, I'm eating stuff off dung. Leave my wife alone. You can't kill her to make a point. And God says, yeah, I can. And you can't get angry. And you can't even mourn. Why? Well, when she does die, Ezekiel says, oh, the people come to Ezekiel and say, hey, your wife died. Why aren't you mourning? It's really weird. And Ezekiel says, because when word comes that the delight of your eyes, Jerusalem, your treasure is gone, you are not to mourn. You are not to blame God. You are to realise the judgment of God is just and right and pure. In verses 13 and 14, we're meant to understand that what God is doing is right, it is holy, it is not some tragedy. When I hear of someone who I know, who's a nice person but not a Christian, dying, I know this means eternal hell. And at times I confess something inside me will say, you know, God, it doesn't really seem fair. That this punishment doesn't seem to fit the crime. You know, perhaps, God, you can just punish them in hell for a while and then extinguish them. It seems fairer. Until, until I try and see things from God's perspective, the holiness of God and the wickedness of sin and that this punishment glorifies God. And I know when I get to heaven, I'm going to see things from his perspective. And I'm not going to question the way he ran this world and his justice. I will rejoice in his holiness, his judgment. Today, I don't understand all these things, but I know one day I will. Ezekiel's wife, I don't understand all that. Somehow, for his sovereign purposes, the potter used that bit of clay to demonstrate a truth, and it is not unfair or wrong. I mean, look, we're all sinners who are going to die. I trust she believed the message of her husband, Ezekiel, and was taken to glory and dying early. Look, that's not that unfair. Dying, Christ coming and dying for our sins, the just for the unjust, that is unfair. 
All I know is that in everything, God does what is right. Verses 25 to 27, word does come. And he says, when it does, I'm going to open your mouth and you'll no longer be mute. So after seven and a half years of being mute, he's suddenly talking. It is to emphasize the fact that he is a prophet and everything he said came true. What's the point of these chapters? Well, let me ask you this. What's the gospel? I hope that you believe these things, that there is a holy God who created us and rules everything, and that because of the fall, we are not holy, and God must judge us and the entire world. And we believe that our only way of escape is Christ, the God-man, through his righteous life and trusting in his death, that is the only escape from judgment. Great. But I hope you also realise there is nothing in the gospel that I can prove scientifically, measurably, no way to authenticate it. I can't show you Almighty God. I can't find Han or Roy, dissect them, hold their heart up and say, see, told you it was depraved, there it is, can't do it. I can't produce the risen God-man, Jesus Christ. I cannot prove that there is a coming judgment that leads to an eternity in hell. These are all truths you believe by faith. But I believe them. Why? Because the Bible says so. Ultimately, I know they're true because the Spirit of God opened my blinded eyes to believe them, but God also chose to authenticate these truths by authenticating the men that he revealed them to. One way was through miracles, calling down fire from heaven, raising the dead. But a lot of prophets didn't get any miracles. Ezekiel doesn't. What Ezekiel got was fulfilled prophecy. God's the only one who knows the beginning from the end. So he revealed things, detailed things, dates, events. And when they came to pass exactly, then they know Ezekiel is a true prophet. And so when he speaks about things you can't verify about God and sin and salvation, you can trust him because that's exactly what Ezekiel is going to do in the second half of the book. He's going to say, let me talk about something really important, something yet future, this judgment, heaven and hell. Here's the point. There's one coming, a shepherd, a king like David. And yeah, you know what? Noah, Daniel, Job, they couldn't save Jerusalem. But there is someone who could have. In fact, he can save any who place their faith in him. He's going to have a righteous life. He's going to have an atoning death. The unrighteous can become righteous. And when the judgment of God comes, those in him will be spared. Believe it. Read the Bible. It is filled with prophecies. Some very specific ones. For example, even this return from exile talks about times when talks about who a persian king it even names him cyrus is going to let them go well before this ever happened there are so many prophecies about jesus his birth his life his death his resurrection fulfilled exactly the fall of jerusalem 70 ad described in detail i could go on and on these are events that absolutely were revealed before they happened and when they happened, you can go, the Bible is true. And the men who said this, when they speak about salvation, we can believe it. So judgment is not unfair. Us receiving mercy is unfair. But thank God that is in here. It is not just judgment. There is also a message of mercy and salvation. And if you want to believe a prophecy, believe the ones about Jesus his return, and that his blood is the only way to escape, then you've understood this passage. Why don't we pray? Oh, Father, I thank you for these truths. I thank you that you sent these prophets, you sent these apostles, you sent these ones who revealed these great truths about you, about our hearts, about judgment, but most importantly about the way of escape, Christ the God-man. 
Lord, if there are any here who are struggling to believe that, I pray that you would open their eyes to these truths in your word. They'd speak with those who brought them. They'd speak with me. I pray that you would show them that these things are true so when the day does come, they can escape. And for those of us who have trusted this, thank you that although we do not deserve it, in Christ we will live. Amen. Well, I've chosen by faith for us to close our time. Let's stand and sing it together. Just a couple of reminders, a couple of times a year we don't have an evening service, today is one of them, and spend some time as a family and thank God for the dads he put in your life. Um, As well, I just want to close 
with Psalm 121, 7 and 8. The Lord will protect you from all harm. He'll protect your life. The Lord will protect your coming and going both now and forever. Amen.